We're going to be taking our Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19 as we do our best to come into the Word of God and receive what God has for us today. I'm thankful uh, that God's Word is a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. I'm glad that it is that thing that in us that directs us and draws us to God, but it also convicts us and helps us and challenges us uh, for living for God. So 1 Kings 19 this morning, thank you so much for being here. And uh, we're going to be looking into this chapter with this great chapter, this great prophet Elijah. Now, if you haven't noticed already in making the bulletin this week, we did everything we could to make it springy, okay? We got green grass on there, blue skies, and a bright sun. And uh, that was the desire of our heart because I'm glad spring is coming. And with it, some wonderful things like allergies. Anybody have experienced allergies these last few weeks? Yeah, yeah. Uh, mosquitoes. We love mosquitoes. And yard sales. I know there's a lot of ladies who are looking for yard sales coming out uh, to a street near you. And uh, I don't really care for yard sales all that much, but many times there'll be a yard sale we pass and there's this huge item out there. It looks beautiful. And so we stop, we turn, take a U-turn, we go back and usually the item that is drawing me has a sign on it that says, not for sale. Not for sale. It's like they put that one item out there to draw everybody to it, to, to bring them to the yard sale, but that's the item that isn't for sale. Well, once upon a time, the, the devil decided to have a huge yard sale. And he was advertising that he was going to be selling off many of his tools. There were shiny tools of temptation, really to draw anybody to it. There were a shimmering instruments of wickedness that could lead anyone down a wrong road. And there was these slimy sins that could get anybody stuck to them and keep and retain anyone. And on the day of the sale, there was a curious crowd that would come and look at all these things that he was, he was selling. And uh, there was this one instrument, this one tool, this one device that was different than any of the other devices. And on it said, not for sale. But it wasn't shimmering and shining. It was old and antique. It wasn't new looking and something that would draw you to it. It was something that didn't look all that shiny at all. It looked worn out. And Satan, uh, they came to Satan and said, why would you sell temptation? And why would you sell instruments of uh, lurement and wickedness? And why would you do all these but not sell this one? And he says, don't touch it. It's my most prized tool in the lives of people. And they said, well, what is that tool? He says, you know, there's times when temptation will not draw certain people. There's times when wickedness will not draw certain people. There's times when sin doesn't draw a, a certain crowd, but this tool works on anyone. I've used this tool against the strongest of men. I've used this tool to cripple the brightest of ladies. I have used this tool against uh, to subdue churches and nations, presidents and kings, pastors and all Christians of all ages. They said, well, what is it? And then he said this, it is the device of depression. The device of depression. So this morning, I want us to look into the life and times of Israel's greatest prophets as we look at this subject this morning, defeating depression, defeating depression. I want us to look in first Kings chapter number 19. Look with me, if you would, in verse number one, the Bible says, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under the juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life. Notice this last phrase, for I am not better than my father's. With the help of the Lord this morning, we will be looking at how, defeating, how to defeat depression in our lives. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessings this morning. God, we love you and God, we're thankful for you. God, we understand that many times in our life, God, the sun is shining on the outside and sometimes there's a lingering cloud on the inside. And God, I don't think that's true of just one or two people in here. I believe most everyone has experienced those same troubling hardships. And so, God, today, as we look into your word, my prayer is, is that you would help your servants today. 
God, help your children to see what you've done for Elijah that we might be able to also receive them for ourselves. God, we're thankful for this wonderful crowd that's gathered, God. We're thankful for every person that's here, that's watching by way of Facebook. And God, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to their heart, uplift them from where they're at. Lord, draw them closer to you. And Lord, help us to see the light of the gospel. For it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen and amen. Now, as Christians, we all find ourselves every so often in the same place that Elijah found himself. It is a place of spiritual defeat after of some great spiritual victory. Now, I want you to think about what Elijah here has just seen, what Elijah has done and experienced in the previous chapter. He has challenged 450 false prophets of Baal uh, to see who the real God was, whether it would be Baal or whether it was Jehovah God. And you understand, they were very sincere in their offering to their God. They were very sincere in their trying to worship this God. But they realized that this God was not powerful. He could not consume the sacrifice they made. And so we see Elijah coming behind them in the evening of the day. And he sets up this sacrifice and he pours water and water on top of it to prove that this couldn't be done by some wildfire, but this was going to be done by the uh, hand of Almighty God. And he calls down fire from heaven, doesn't it? And God consumes the sacrifice and they say, all of Israel says, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And could you imagine all Greenfield shouting, the Lord, He is God from what we've done? And then not only that, but it's been in a drought for three and a half years. And Elijah prays and he asks God to send the rain. And he goes and he looks and there's a cloud in the shape of a man's hand, right? And that cloud comes over to where they are. And the Bible says the, the rain begins to fall. He has this great spiritual victory, but on the opposite end of a great spiritual victory, there comes the satanic powers of discouragement and dis depression. And I'm here to tell you that if you've ever experienced any kind of spiritual victory, what on the other side is waiting for you is an attack of the devil. And many of it will be a, an attack of trying to make you despair. Because if he can't beat you in victory with God, then he will try to do his best to beat you in the victory of your mind. And like Elijah, there are occasions when we are weak and allow it. Now, there are three occasions here that causes him to have, the, to have this discouragement, this depression. Very quickly, by way of introduction, I want you to notice this. The first one was outward threats. There were outward threats. Look with me, if you would, in verse number two. The Bible says in 1 Kings 19, verse number two, And Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, Here was the words that he, she wanted him to hear. So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Elijah had killed all the false prophets of Baal. He was tired of this mockery, this uh, blot in the eyes of Israel. So he takes them and he kills all these prophets. And Jezebel sends a threat. And the threat is, I'm going to do the same thing to you by tomorrow. And if it doesn't happen by tomorrow, then I'm going to let the gods do that to me. I'm going to tell you, it was empty threats, wasn't it? Jezebel didn't die and neither did Elijah die. But whether they were intentional or whether they were empty, Satan used this to accomplish his job. Because what we find is Elijah was thoroughly discouraged. Have you ever been discouraged by toxic words? Have you ever been at work and somebody say something that just flattens your curve? Have you ever been around someone that can seem to always just bring a cloud over you? I'm talking about outward threats. It brings discouragement into our life. But not only outward threats, but I want you to know relational separation. Relational separation. Look with me in verse number three, what the Bible says. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah. Notice what the next phrase says. And left his servant there. Do you see how Elijah got alone? I'm going to tell you, that is one of the greatest ploys of the devil in your life is to separate you from the relationships that are around you. He'll do anything he can to, to drive a wedge in the, your uh, marriage. He'll do anything he can to drive a wedge in the relationship you have with your parents. He'll do anything he can to drive a relationship between you and your children. He wants to uh, uh, take you to a place of aloneness. And can I tell you, Eli this was kind of Elijah's fault, wasn't he? He says, I want you to stay here. Has anybody ever said to the one that's trying to care for them, I just need a little alone time. How many's ever said that? Anybody ever said that? You know what? Big mistake. Don't allow it. 
There was a couple things that attacked him. There was outward threats. There were relational separation. There was inward comparisons. Would you look with me in verse number four? But he found himself a day's journey in the wilderness and came and sat down in a Virginia tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life. This last phrase in verse number four says, for I'm not better than my father's. Everybody knows who Elijah is, don't they? Everybody knows who Father Elijah is. Elijah was this great prophet. He was that one that did call fire down from heaven and, and he caused it not to rain for three and a half years. And then at one prayer, he brings the rain back down. But let me ask you a question. What's Elijah's father's name? Do you know? He, he says, I'm not better than my father. He actually uses plural, fathers. So who's, what was Elijah's grandfather's name? You know what? The Bible never tells us. And so although this wasn't true, he was eating himself alive on the inside. Why? Because of inward comparisons. I'm going to tell you, when you start trying to compare your life to everyone else, that is one of the greatest tools Satan has to cause you to be depressed on the inside. And so we find these three things that we're bringing him into this cloud of depression. So what does God do? What is it that God comes to him with? I'm going to tell you, God doesn't come and take something away. God comes and adds something to. God didn't come to him and wag a finger. God did not come and uh, rebuke Elijah. He comes and adds four things to his life. And I want us to notice these four things that he adds to his life to help bring him out of this place of discouragement and depression. Number one, I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Would you write this down? The first thing that comes to him is the presence of the Father. It's the presence of the Father. Look with me in verse number five. The Bible says, and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, arise and eat. Isn't that a beautiful sight? The Bible says that an angel comes to him. What it is, is God has come to him and has touched him and says, I want you to arise and eat. How many is thankful for the holy presence of a loving father? How many is thankful for the touch of a, a holy God on your life? You say, Brother Tommy, it says an angel doesn't say uh, a God. Well, I'm going to tell you, this person was anything but an angel. I want you to look at verse number seven. The Bible says, and the angel of the Lord came again the second time. Now, when you see this phrase, angel of the Lord, it is not talking about Gabriel. It's not talking about Michael. It's not talking about any angel. What it's talking about is this is a theophany. What it is, is it is a pre-incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I'm going to tell you, when his servant was there and hurting, when his servant was there and dying by inward comparisons, it was God himself who comes down to him and he gives him a touch. I'm thankful for the presence of God in our lives when so many times we feel on the bottom, God wants to come to you and give you a touch from heaven. I'm going to tell you, there's some people here who are battling great discouragement. And they have done everything they can to talk them in, th themselves into coming to church today. They got up when they didn't want to get up. They got ready when they didn't want to get ready. When they didn't feel like putting their come to Jesus, come to church, clothes on. They, they would rather stay in bed, but they've gotten up. They've come to church. I'm going to tell you, you've came to the best place, the best place to battle discouragement because this is God's house. Amen. And this is a place where God will come and touch your heart when you need a touch from Him. The Bible says in Psalms 34, verse number 18, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And I'm going to tell you, that wasn't only true in Elijah's day, that was true in your day. And He is still nigh unto them that have a broken heart. If you're battling depression, you've come to the right place. So why not today come the rest of the way, kneel at an altar and say, as the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your care upon him for he careth for you. Not only do we find the, the presence of the father, but secondly, I want you to notice the provisions for our frailty. The provisions for our frailty. There were some things that Elijah needed in his person that would have either allowed him to continue in the journey or would have taken him out of the journey if his provisions were not met. And so I want you to notice what God brings to Elijah in verse number five through verse number seven. 
And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and lay him down again. And Elijah and the angel of the Lord uh, came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. God not only noticed what Elijah had been through, but God also knew what Elijah was about to go through. And so what we find is that when God showed up, God brought exactly what Elijah needed. And that's not only true for Elijah, but that is also true for you. For Samson, it was a jawbone of a donkey that he needed. Uh, for Abraham, it was a son that he needed. For Samson, or I'm sorry, for Jeremiah, it was a fire within his bones. For John the Baptist, it was a word from the Lord while he was in prison. Uh, for uh, Peter, it was a crowing rooster. For Isaiah, it was a, a picture, a vision of the throne of God. Uh, for uh, Noah, it was a blueprint of a very, very, very large boat. But God knew exactly what each of his servants needed to give them the jolt to get out of this state of depression, this state of hurt, this state of confusion and into the desire to do something more for God. And I'm going to tell you, that's not only true of Elijah and Samson and Jeremiah, but that is also true from you. God knows exactly the provision that you need to help the frailty of you. And for some, it might be a jawbone to fight with. For some, it might be a crewing rooster, a rooster to rebuke you with. For some, it might be a blueprint of what's out in the future. But I'm going to tell you, God knows exactly the provisions for our frailty. What a wrestling match for Jacob. But here, a meal for Elijah. God knows and is faithful to show up right on time with the provisions that we need to meet those frailties in our life. Thirdly, I want you to notice the path for the future. He shows him the path for the future. And that's found in verse number 15. And the Lord said unto him, Elijah, he says, I need to talk to you. Go up on the mountain. I want to speak with you there. Verse number 15, and the Lord said unto him, go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. What we find here is when Elijah got on the mountain and sat under this juniper tree, the thought on his heart was, I'm done. I've come to the end of myself. What he will say in verse number four is, uh, I, it is enough. I, my life is now over. It is enough. But what I found is what God shows him is that there is a great path for his future. God didn't give up on Elijah and he wanted Elijah to continue this great journey for where he had planned for him. And I'm here to tell you that there's people in this room that God has a great plan, a great path for the future. And if you will simply set yourself on a desire to please God, you'll do what, you, what he has accomplished for you to do. You say, but Tommy, does God really have a job for me? It depends. On what? Well, let me ask you this. Would you extend your right arm to your neighbor? Just go ahead and extend your right arm to your neighbor. Would you do that? Everybody extend your right arm to your neighbor. Pop it out to where your wrist is like this, okay? With a, one of your neighbors, I want you to go ahead and take your two fingers and put it right there. Okay? Will you put it right there? Now, the, the, the person who's getting their pulse check, will you say these words? Am I alive? <laughs> Some of us at a nine o'clock service on a Sunday morning is not alive. Are you, say, am I alive? Okay, now if you are the neighbor and you feel a pulse, here's what I want you to say. God has a wonderful path for you. Because if you're alive and you're breathing, here's what I'm going to tell you. God has a wonderful path for you. I don't care what lies the devil has sown into your heart. I don't care what, what everyone else is saying. I'm going to tell you, God knows the way that he has planned for you. And he is telling Elijah here the exact things I want you to go do. You know what you need? You need a meeting from God where you just say, God... I'm here. Do with me as you, as you please. I want you to notice the path for our future. He had a path for them to travel. Lastly, I want you to notice the presence, the present of a friend. Look at me in verse number 16. 
And Jehu, the son of Nimshah, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. Notice these, this, next, this next phrase. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Meola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. What we find here is God comes to Elijah and says, I want you to go do these certain things. But on the way, I want you to pick up a certain young man. And that young man is going to be prophet in thy place whenever I'm done. Now, if you know anything about the life of Elijah, his life continues for many, many, many more years. He will do so much more. But from this point forward, he will do all of those things with the presence of a young man as a friend there beside him. And what we find is that sometimes all we need from God is someone to be that bow-wrapped gift of a friend to help you fight the good fight. Elijah still had a long journey, but God would allow him to fight the rest of this journey with someone beside him to be his friend. God realized that he needed someone beside him to help bear the burden of this journey. And I'm going to tell you, what God desires for you to have in your life, what God wants to give you is that friend to help you along in the journey. This past week on Tuesday, we decided to go to West Virginia. I think I mentioned that last Sunday morning. We was going to West Virginia on, on Tuesday, about a four and a half, a little bit over uh, trip, four and a half hours down there. And uh, so me and Brother Joe and Brother Dave, we got up early in the morning, didn't we, Brother, Brother Dave? And uh, we left. We left out of here we, really early. I mean, we left here at six o'clock, you know. <laughs> Some of you are like, that's not early. Some of you are like, I didn't even know there was two six o'clocks in one day. We left here at six o'clock and we started driving and we was driving like the madman. I mean, we were getting down there for this meeting because down there in the meeting was an opportunity to hear a missions project that would allow us to reach a hundred million people with the gospel each year. And uh, they're doing they're using a lot of technologies to put it in front of people who may have never seen it, especially in um, countries in the eastern world. And so we were wanting to get down there. We, we got down. We was making great time and we had about 45 minutes to an hour to spare. So we stopped. We stopped at the good holy roller place called Bob Evans. OK, and we had a good, good breakfast and we sat there and we laughed till we cried. We was telling stories about the scaredest we was ever been in our life. And we were we were sitting at that table literally crying. We were laughing so hard. We get back in the car. We've got an hour to get down there and about um, 30 minutes to drive. And so we get on the road and we're, we're going and we, we get to a place that's 19 miles away from our location. 19 miles. I think it said 25 minutes. 19 miles. And the traffic stopped. People started getting out of their car. Brake lights went off as they put it in park and was just sitting there. And so I get out and uh, we're walking around the car because, you know, that's the thing that you got to do. That's how you figure it out. When you're parked, you just got to walk around the car a couple times. So I get on my, my, uh, my maps on my phone and I notice that there, we're in West Virginia, by the way. I notice that there's this track up a mountain and down a mountain and up another mountain and down another mountain. And it cuts back into the same road that we are in. But praise God, that road comes before the red on my, on my map. I say, boys, let's turn around. We're going to take this side road. And so we do. We make a U-turn and, and we come to the road. And I'm going to tell you, Olivia, the first sign that sh should have said this was a bad idea was the name of the road was Cornstalk Road. <laughs> I should have seen that and said, no way, Jose. But if that didn't do it, it was a one lane road that I think its last paving was in 1960. <laughs> we thought, well, it couldn't get any worse than this. That was a bad mistake. We get on it. We're on it for about a mile. I think this, this was about 17 miles. We get on it. We're about a mile into it and the road turns to gravel. And we say... It can't get any worse 
than this. <laughs> Very shortly, we were on this road that turned from gravel to dirt. But if you have been in the southern states in the last little bit, you will notice that there is flooding everywhere. So what used to be a dirt road was now a mud road. We're dressed like this. Have you seen how shiny my shoes are? In the mud road, Brother Larry, I, I got out of the car, looked down in one of those, you know, those ditches that, that cars had made, and I could look down and I could see China on the other side. We, were, we said, well, we can't, there's literally no place to turn around. And so we kept on going, we kept driving, we kept driving. And uh, but probably about five, six, seven times, we, we hear this unusual sound. <laughs> as the bottom of the car is dragging the dirt and mud and rocks underneath us. And I'm going to tell you, it was, it was troubling. You don't believe it. Watch this. That is a 2021 Malibu with a 5.7 inch clearance. And that's the road we're now on. <laughs> we pray, we keep driving, we pray, we keep driving. We're nervous as all get out. We're laughing because we're giddy. <laughs> and we finally get out to a one lane road that's black, you know, that's 1960 black topped. We finally get out to 35 and guess what? It was still standstill. We didn't get out in front of it. I, I call and, and we're talking to some of the truck drivers around us and they say that there was a fatality in a wreck above us. And um, they had to wait for the corners. Probably be about another five hours is what the people on site say. We got 19 miles to our destination and had to turn around and come back home. We, so we did. And... You know, we were talking about how, man, this is just such a wasted trip. This is nine hours out of a day, and we have been extremely busy the last few months. And so we turned around and we thought, well, is there something else we can do on the way home? So we did. We looked up in Dayton, and there was an Air Force Museum. Anybody ever been to the Air Force Museum in Dayton? Well, we said, well, we've we got a little extra time now. We'll just stop there on the way home and, and try to make a day out of it. We get up there, and the guy has this metal detector and says we can't have any knives in here so you can either take it back to your car or donate the knife and I didn't have a knife brother Joe didn't have a knife brother Dave had gotten a brand new knife from Mike and Patty Ricketts for Christmas and he says I've got a knife he says I'll take it to the car well since I was full of good ideas that day <laughs> I ran out to him and I said brother Dave listen the car is half a mile out there there's no reason to do that let me hide it for you There was this plaque, Brother Dave, wasn't there? It says, wall, wall of honor. And so I put his knife on a little peg behind the wall of honor. And I said, nobody will ever find this. We go in and we're having a good time. We laugh and we're cutting up with each other. We're looking at all these planes and I don't understand how planes work. I just don't. I can't get it. We come out and Brother Dave, Brother Dave says, I'm going to go get my knife. And he goes over to get his knife and there's people taking pictures in front of the wall of honor. And, and uh, so he has to wait there in front of the wall of honor to get their pictures done. And he comes over there and he looks behind it. And the guy who had saw us come out and come back in real quick apparently had been watching us. And he came out and took his brand new Mike and Patty bought knife for Christmas. And we died laughing. I mean, we died laughing. What we thought was this. Man, this was a wasted, a wasted trip. But you know what I think it was? I think it was God ordained. You know why? Because for nine hours, all we did was chat and laugh and cut up and poke fun at each other and just had a good time of being friends. Yep. Weren't in an office, weren't behind a desk, wasn't had a list of things to do. It was just being friends. I'm going to tell you, God has a gift wrapped up for you. And it is a gift of a friend are you shutting them out? 
Are you pushing them away? That's good for you. Come on. There's this old spiritual song that says something like this. <clears throat> you got a friend in me. <laughs> you got a friend in me. Oh, when the road looks gravelly and muddy ahead. And you're miles and miles from your nice warm bed. I'm sorry I had his, take his knife taken away. That's enough. okay, I can get another. <laughs> you just remember what your old pal said. You've got a friend in me. Now I'm going to tell you, if you need a friend, we would love Amen. to be that friend.